Doctrine of God, how does it impact your life and worship? If nobody answers, Pastor Jacob has to because he raised the question. Okay, 12, 1 and 2. Yep. To be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice. Okay. So our worship, it flows from what we understand about God. Good. Good key text for answering that question. Anybody else? Any other thoughts on that? That reminder that worship is much bigger than our singing. Um, Worship is a response to the worthyship of God in all that we do. Uh, And when we fail to worship outside of our singing, it's because we have failed to think appropriately on God um, as well. Yep, the God is the fount of love and informs us on what love should look like. And our love for others is on the basis of how God has first loved us. It's first John concept. Okay. I want to begin by reading. I know that uh, it would be easy to say Pastor Sam stole the thunder, but I think it's appropriate to read God's Word twice. So I'm going to read from Psalm 19 as we talk about natural theology tonight. If there is a text that drives natural theology, it is likely from Psalm 19. I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins and let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This psalm begins by talking about creation. The heavens declare the glory of God. There is no speech or words whose voice is not heard. The sun rises and it's nothing is hidden from its heat. This psalm begins with the natural revelation or the revelation of creation. What does creation reveal about God? It shifts in verse 7 to special revelation. What can be learned about God specifically through God's word, the Bible. and talks about God's law, God's testimonies, God's precepts, God's commandments, God's rules, and how sweet they are and how they are all designed that we might live before him rightly and that God might work in us as our rock and our redeemer, that we might live according to his word with a great desire to honor him and fear him, worshiping him rightly. This is the, probably the chief 
psalm, or I would even say text in all of Scripture, for the doctrine of revelation as it is specifically in a natural revelation. Okay? I'm going to use a couple of different terms tonight. I'm going to talk about natural revelation. I'm going to talk about natural theology. At some point, I'll talk about natural law. Um, I'll even use the term general revelation. I want to clarify a little bit of the way that I'm using some of those terms. And you've got on your notepad, or note page, I believe, a definition from Russell Moore. Uh, they are about natural theology. What is natural theology, or what is the discipline of natural theology? It is the study of God from nature in many cases. It is the attempt to build a theological structure on the basis of general revelation apart from God's witness in the Scriptures and in Jesus Christ. A natural theology is the attempt to build a theological structure on the basis of general revelation apart from from God's special revelation in the scriptures and in Christ. Okay? So this is distinct from special revelation. General revelation is for all people everywhere. When you go outside, you see the stars, you see the moon, you see the sun, you see the ocean if you're close to it. You see creation. Not only do we see creation in general revelation, but often the conscience is within general revelation. Generals for all people everywhere. Special is revealed through God's covenant to a specific people. Frequently, special revelation is used of biblical revelation. God has revealed himself in a variety of ways as we see encounter, people encountering God in the pages of Scripture. But today, we look at it and say God doesn't reveal himself for all people to somebody anymore. The pages of Scripture are closed. So special revelation has ended at this point, Pastor Sam will talk more about special revelation and biblical revelation next week. But largely when we think of special revelation, you can think of biblical revelation. Okay. But general revelation for all people, often um, it, we can look at general revelation as natural revelation. What's revealed through nature. And natural theology is the attempt to build a theological structure on natural revelation. Or natural or general revelation. So, stop for a minute. What do you think makes natural theology easy? What would make it easy to do natural theology? We can start with, if you don't answer that one, we'll go to what makes it hard. But what would make it easy? Let's do the easy question first. Everybody can accept the facts in one sense is what you said. I'm going to tell you that I think everybody can see the facts. Um, and I want to distinguish between they could accept, but they do not accept the facts. But I think you're, you're on to something that in the everybody aspect, and it is open to all. It's available to all. Yeah. Absolutely. It's much easier to see the trees are beautiful. You want to have a good conversation with somebody? Like, this is a conversation starter. Isn't the world beautiful? That's an easy starting point for conversation with somebody that you don't even know all that well. Let's contrast to that. Isn't the Bible wonderful? That's going to get you a different reaction than isn't the world beautiful? Or isn't the world wonderful? One of those is going to start a conversation that is generally positive almost every time, and this may take some negative turns. The other one, you never know what you're going to get. Okay? We can all see natural revelation. We read natural revelation differently, though. We can accept, but we do not universally accept. Okay? Anybody else on what might make it easy? I think we've covered, we've covered the answer I was looking for, but there may be another answer there. Okay, what makes natural revelation hard or studying natural revelation hard? It is not very specific. It is not very specific. Uh, that is, there, there are numerous answers to this that I'm looking for, by the way, and that is one of them. All right, it is not very specific. 
Yeah, it's how you explain creation. That's not an easy thing to do at times. Okay? Yes. There are people that do not want to believe, and we're going to come to that later. That, I think, is one of the hard things about natural, natural revelation. It's the same thing, by the way, if we were to do special revelation, though. In general, nobody's gonna, going to embrace special revelation and reject natural revelation for that particular reason. There are some, though, that would actually reject, even within Christian spheres, that would reject natural the- revelation or natural theology. I would even say it's an impossible task. You're not looking on physically and seeing God, so good. All right. What else could make natural theology hard? Preconceived notions. notions. Absolutely. What about for Christians? What can make it hard? What do you mean? Okay. Yep. Sometimes it's busyness. I would say one of the tasks, uh, the, the difficulties of natural theology is often we uh, end up worshiping the stuff instead of the stuff giver. So I- instead of worshiping God as the fount of all goodness and beauty, we simply pursue beauty and pleasure. When beauty and pleasure is intended to spark and move us to worship and thankfulness and gratefulness. At times we pursue it as a mean, an end unto itself. I think the ongoing effects of sin on the brain and what we can know not only impact non-believers, but certainly impact believers as well. I think one of the hardest ones, and the ones we haven't really covered, but that you start getting into the more you look into the academic discipline of natural theology, is how much we require special revelation to interpret natural revelation. Okay? If natural theology, as, Mus- as Russell Moore says, is an attempt to build a theological structure on the basis of general revelation apart from God's witness in scriptures and in Jesus Christ, that means that at its root, natural theology is building a doctrine of God on the basis of what we do not find in Scripture. So we are laying to some degree to do and to appropriately use his definition, which is probably the most common type of definition. We actually have to lay aside the foundation of the Bible and then proceed. But the Bible is what interprets for us, though particularly those with a long-term Christian worldview, how we understand that God is creator. It's the way that we understand the nature of his creation. It forms the foundation not only for God as creator, but God as redeemer. There's so much from special revelation that we use to interpret natural revelation. And the longer you've been a Christian, the more often you are going to do that. So, There have been some that have come along and said, nope, natural theology, natural revelation is impossible for a Christian. The only way to rightly understand the book of creation is through the book of God's word. You cannot do natural theology. And then others say, yeah, absolutely you can, but there's limits to natural theology. Some would say believers can't do it because they've got this, you know, we we see through the lens of scripture. Others would say non-believers can never do natural theology because of what Romans 1 tells us about people universally rejecting God, which is a text we're going to come to later. But I'm going to attempt to do as much natural theology as possible under the definition of not using Scripture here at the beginning. And then I'm going to backload and put a bunch of Scripture in and probably have us do some discussion of Scripture and what Scripture contributes to our understanding of natural theology or how Paul used at times natural theology in his interaction with others. All right, I want to give you two warnings. One, do not do natural theology alone. Okay? Do not just look and say, hey, I'm going to study creation and therefore figure out all about that and just form a doctrine of God on the basis of what I see in nature. 
doing natural theology absent special revelation is going to lead to something flawed. Two, I want you to recognize that if you're studying this, if you're looking into this, if you do some more research, you do some further reading and the suggestions that I'm going to make, you're going to see that this is a hotly debated area of Christian theology because people just can't decide on what is appropriate within the realms of Christian, of natural theology, what's actually flowing from special revelation, how limited can it be because of the effects of sin. Okay. So two warnings from there. One, it can't be on its own, and two, recognize it's a hotly debated area for those that really care about that. Okay. I want to remind you natural revelation is best understood according to special revelation. I think apart from the work of God revealed in special revelation or the Bible, we're not only going to misinterpret natural revelation, but according to Romans later, we're going to reject God and his means of redemption. I would tell you that I think as a summary level, natural revelation condemns the non-believer and natural revelation cannot on its own save anyone. Yeah, that's Romans 1, 18 through 20. We're going to get there in just a little bit. Yes. What can be seen about God is plainly known to them because God has made it plain to them, and yet there's a universal rejection of that. So I would say natural revelation condemns the non-believer, cannot save any, but can be used by God's Spirit, though, can be used by God's Spirit to prepare one for special revelation. Some people, sometimes people can look on and say, wow, there is a case for God, for a powerful God, for a God at work in the world on the basis of natural th- th- used by the Spirit to prepare one to say, well, let me look through the pages of the Bible. And in other cases, can be used by God in the life of the believer. I think it should be used by the life of God and the believer to contribute to our understanding and worship of him as on display in creation. Right. More notes that general revelation has emerged as a focal point of controversy throughout the history of the church, and it's actually a controversy that changes constantly. It's rarely revolved around the same points of contention. And yet, in some historic Baptist confessions, uh, confessions of the faith, Here's a statement that is found in the London Baptist Confession of 1689, Philadelphia, and Charleston. All right, the light of nature, the works of creation and providence, do so far manifest the goodness, the wisdom, the power of God as to leave men inexcusable, yet not sufficient to give knowledge of God and his will, which is necessary unto salvation. Yeah, those confessions are saying, listen, there's some things you can see about God from creation and providence. It's goodness, wisdom, and power. But that leaves us without excuse. That can leave us condemned, but it does not give us the knowledge of God necessary for salvation. Condemned by the book of creation, redeemed by the book of the Bible. Condemned by the book of the world, redeemed according to the book of the word. All right, I'm going to recommend, I'm loosely recommending it because I couldn't find anything great that I was really thrilled with on natural theology. So I went with something short. You guys know how I feel about it. And this one even has pictures. Like this is a page. I like this. Not only that, but it follows up with that, like with a a short quote. So you can make it through those three pages really, really quick. So you feel really smart when you read those three pages in a row, three pages of white space. It's awesome. All right. John Frame's book, A Nature's Case for God. I like what he did, but I wasn't thrilled with what he did because I think uh, he admits that he takes a presupposition of special revelation, and I think he builds more on special revelation than I would have liked him to. I would like to have seen him kind of do a little bit of both and. Um, but I thought he did a good job admitting his foundation and building on his foundation. I just wish he would done, hey, he did what he did well. I wish he would have done something differently. But it's a good little short book. Um, he talks about how natural theology can teach us about greatness. You know, you, I, most of you have heard me say before, nobody stands at the edge of the Grand Canyon and feels awesome. Nobody stands at the edge of the ocean and says, I am so big and so strong. There is nothing I cannot do. Unless they're a three or four-year-old that's fighting the waves. You know, when my kids go to the beach when they were younger, 
Jesse would stand on the edge of the ocean and we'd fight the waves and try to stop the waves and that doesn't work. Um, that doesn't work with little waves, much less big, powerful waves. Standing and staring at the greatness of creation makes someone feel insignificant and aware of the awe and the wonder. Frame says that natural theology teaches us to look on the greatness. He talks about it, teaches us to look at the oneness of a God, one God who owns it all and brings it all into one system according to his great wisdom. He says that if we're thinking straight, we can see, we see God's mind in every event and process according to natural theology. He talks about how natural theology took, teaches us about God's goodness, it teaches us about morality, and it gets into the realm of the conscience. He really outlines and says, look at the book of creation and look at the book of conscience as he talks about natural theology. Jason, yes. When you talk about viewing nature as seeing the goodness of God, I mean, I can see that for creation, but when you look at nature, say nature as a mm -hmm. whole, it may look great from a big vantage point, but if you look at individual events, It, if, you, if you could look at mm -hmm. nature and come up with that's the nature of how things are. Right. When you stand, you know, we were at the beach last week and the waves were awesome because there was a hurricane churning a thousand miles off the coast. And what appeared so beautiful was all actually about destruction. Um, and there are some that would look on creation and say, it's terrible um, upon further the violence of it all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, those are observations. Those are factual observations. Mm -hmm. What conclusion do you draw from it? Yeah. Which is one of the weaknesses of natural theology. I, just, I know hearing that, my thought is that when, when God first created everything, it wasn't like that. It was perfect. That stuff didn't enter into our world until we sinned. Mm -hmm. Yep, now we're back in a special. Yep, Jacob. I would also say, though, in response to what Tom is saying, like, um, you could see the greatness of God and the beauty of God in the beautiful things of creation. But then you also learn about I mean, the great power and wrathfulness of God and the other components within natural theology. Um, and think, I mean, just think about how God responds to sin. Uh, you see that scariness also in uh, natural theology. So you see these both components of it because God is fully all these things. Yeah. You can see the wrath. And, and one of the things, Tom, I would say is even in the, let's talk about the food chain for a minute. I mean, the food chain is violent. Um, it, it is bloody, it's gory, it's violent. And yet we think of, th there's a difference in greatness as in like, oh, that's cute and cuddly. And wow, like there is a intricacy to the food chain from photosynthesis all the way up that testifies to greatness, even if it doesn't necessarily testify to gentleness. But some would reject that and say all should be gentle. So, yeah, it, there are challenges, and I think you're on to one of them. Um, with that. If you think of the song, How Great There Are, um, he's talking about, you know, the rolling thunder, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's not all the gentle and uh, yeah. cuddly thing. Right. Not all that God is sovereign over is gentle and cuddly. You know, if there was a good quote from tonight, it might be, and from this theology class, it might be that God is not always gentle and cuddly. You do not want to cuddle up with God when you are in sin. Um, right. Noah's Ark, et cetera.
Mm -hmm. you know, we would like it to be cuddly. We, we would like yeah. it uh, to rain but not have hurricanes. Mm -hmm. We would like it to do, but but we are man and we don't get to pick right. that thing. Just like in nature, we don't get to pick what God is. And and we that is the common thing now is we we want to say well I don't want to do I don't want to accept a God that's X Y or whatever it is. Just like in nature, we say we don't want to accept the God that would make a terrible hurricane to right. hit, you know, this we, place. We want flowers but not bees. Right. And if we have bees, we don't want them to stink. There are some things that we don't like. Some of that is because our taste is wrong. Some of that is because our views are wrong. Um, yeah, I want to, y'all are on to it. And there's weaknesses to natural theology. You can't go but so far with it. And it's not always read the same way. And some things don't seem. Uh, great. One of the things that as you start branching in, if you're going to study natural theology, people start trying to move that into natural law and making a case for uh, law and morality on the basis of what is seen in creation. Uh, frame and I join frame here are very skeptical of the ability to make a significant case for the way things ought to be based upon the way that we read nature alone. Um, if that's the case, then we should kill in and eat anybody that is lesser than us. Um, to some degree, we see that in, in nature. Um, and yet, there's also, though, within natural theology, um, it's, it, life doesn't go well when people constantly go around killing each other. Society thrives when people are not violent. Um, so there's some things to be learned from that. Um, he says on natural law to recognize that natural law uh, is not actually a secular thing, Anyways, natural law, if you were to form such a thing, it would actually be a witness to the true God. We would be thinking about how God does, <coughs> excuse me, how God does govern the world through uh, his truth. He talks about how sinners naturally repress the law. Uh, therefore, natural law is not a good way to govern society. He talks about the only way to actually understand natural law is through the spectacles and the lens of Scripture anyways. So he's pretty skeptical on natural law. Um, and then he goes on to say we shouldn't really appeal to natural law for governing society all the time um, because some people are going to simply reject the authority of the way that God has seemed to make the world because they want to reject the God behind the, the world or the God they do reject the God who has created the world. So uh, as we think about natural theology, natural revelation, what can be known about God from it? Okay. I'm going to give you some clues. I'm borrowing from Tim Keller's book, Reason for God, here. Uh, on five, five, I believe it's five clues, five or six clues coming up about God. And he talks about clues. He doesn't use the term proof, I don't think. He talks about clues. He says none of these are conclusive. All of these have holes in them. But when taken on all of their weight and a variety of other suggestions, they seem to have more weight than the alternative case. Can you win a unanimous jury with this? Probably not. Can you suggest that the weight of evidence is greater from these than the evidence that there is not a God behind nature? I think so. The weight of the argument, the majority of the case, I think, is behind it. He talks about the fact that there is an originator, that behind, that there seems to be, science seems to be, at this point at least unified, that there is something and sometime when the, the world ever began expanding. Some, you can refer to that as the Big Bang if you want to, and you can understand that however you want to. God spoke, bang, it happened, and we have the world exactly as it is, or you know, developing as it, you, you see it in your uh, children's storybook Bible. You, God spoke, bang, it happened through a variety of processes, and we'll talk about those options later. But behind all of that, there seems to be an originator. It didn't just happen out of nowhere. Nothing happens out of nowhere. So there must be something behind to start an ever-expanding universe. Secondly, not only is there an originator, but the fine-tuning argument. If we were to sit down at this point and uh, play a game, a couple of hands of poker, uh, when we were to do that in the church, we would have a new discussion about it. But if we were to sit down and play a couple of games of poker, I'm going to assume that all of you are familiar with poker. If not, I'm going to take advantage of you at some point by playing poker with you. But if I were to get 20 hands in a row of four aces, if I were to get four aces, 20 hands in a row, in a good old Western theme movie, at this point you would pull out your pistol 
aim it at me and you probably would not even give me an opportunity to clarify how that happened. You would not look at that as a simple object of randomization. If you did ask me to explain myself and I said, oh, you know, there's 52 cards in the deck, that means there's a number of possibilities that could happen. It's going to happen at some point if you give enough chances, and today just happened to be that time that I've gotten four aces, 20 hands in a row. Alternatively, as another example is shared, if we were to put 50 of our expert marksmen lined up from six feet away to execute somebody, all 50 of them filed sim fired simultaneously and nobody happened to strike the target, you would not assume that it was a product of random chance that all 50 marksmen missed from six feet away. You would assume that there was intervention. So also the fine tuning of creation suggests that there is an incredible likelihood of divine intervention. Is that a shoe in No. Is it possible for 20 hands in a row, four ace? It is possible. It is not the most likely assumption. Okay. Thirdly, there's a regularity to nature. Much of the scientific method depends on repeatable observations and assumes that the same thing will happen the next time. For there to be regular order and repeatability is likely taken from a God who is regular, faithful, and trustworthy, who sustains the world that he created. This is borrowed from Augustine and his confessions. I believe it's picked up on by C.S. Lewis, but simply the desires. Uh, that desires are not always fulfilled, but that typically a desire corresponds to reality. The fact that I am hungry often means that there is a real thing called food. What I crave is often in some way, shape, or form rooted in reality. It may not mean it's coming true, but it is often rooted in reality. If I am tired, it means that there's probably this thing called sleep. If there, I have a relational desire, it probably means there's these things called friendship and love. And that humanity at large often is desiring of eternity, suggesting that there is a high likelihood that there is a corresponding reality. Also, desiring to be known comprehensively and yet loved, not loved for a fakeness, but loved in reality, suggests that there may be that possibility. Is that a shoe and argument? Does that one win at all? No. Taken on its weight with the rest of them, though I think it suggests something about God from natural revelation. Keller goes on to say that the theory that there is a God who made the world accounts for the evidence we see better than the theory that there is no God. He goes on in his chapter on morality, clues for morality and conscience. And he says this, this is dealing with what Tom hit earlier. Though nature is based on violence, we generally believe it's wrong for stronger humans to kill weaker ones. That's a general assumption within humanity is that the biggest should not kill toddlers. But if violence is natural and we're just a product, another animal, and no different from it, why would, why would we think that's wrong? The distinguishment of the human conscience from the way that the rest of the world eats each other points to that there is something behind morality. And it also hits, as you mentioned a minute ago, when conscience says correct and says the strong should protect the weak, it tells us that the violence of the world that we live in is a brokenness. The story of the Bible is that God is a God who is and offers peace, that the world is broken, and we have an answer for why violence and disorder exists. Our hearts no wrong exists, even if our minds don't always articulate it well. Now, uh, I mentioned this when preaching through Romans a couple of months ago. Even people that want to talk about all morality being relative, if you ever kind of get hit with that, well, what's right to, right to you is wrong. You know, right's right for some people in some places, but there's no like universal thing. Like ask them for their wallet and start running away and they will actually argue that there is morality, that you have done something wrong to steal their wallet. People have a fine sense of morality and right and wrong when you begin to hurt them. It may not seem wrong, and they may want to argue that it is not wrong, but when you start hurting them, they begin to feel that there is something actually wrong. No, it ought not to be that way. 
Keller goes on to say that morality, uh, we, we should look and recognize that there's a source of morality beyond culture. That morality can't be determined by an individual. Well, I feel it's right for me to steal your wallet, therefore I will steal it. What's right for me is right for me. You can't tell me what's wrong. I'll steal your wallet. Nobody, that doesn't work well. Doesn't seem right. Nobody seems to accept that one. And also, morality can't be determined by the majority. So if the majority, let me give you an example. If the majority gets together and decides that we're going to eliminate and vote out, or vote to execute all minorities, let's, now we're back in the 40s in Germany and the Holocaust. Let's get rid of minorities. Majority rules. Majority cannot determine morality. Neither can the individual. There is a source of morality that is pointed at and that people know somehow, some way, exists beyond. It's contribution of natural theology. We're going to do some more discussion on the scriptural stuff in a minute, but I want to try to pound through this stuff on Aquinas. Um, I give you an article to kind of reference. Thomas Aquinas is a a theologian from about a thousand years ago who makes five different arguments for the existence of God. Um, I've given you a brief note there on your note page. He talks about how that anything that's in motion was first started by something else. It's for an object to be in motion, it was started by something else. While the world's in motion, how, you know, this, this, this series of infinite looking back. Well, eventually there had to be an unmoved mover. And he suggests there's an unmoved mover. He says when something exists, it's because there's a cause and effect. There's got to be an initial cause. Otherwise, we have an infinite loop. He says that God is that initial cause, that God is that unmoved mover, that God is the necessary being who brings all the other stuff that is contingent upon it into action. He talks about degrees of beauty and truth and goodness, suggests that there is something called goodness and beauty and truth and a universal standard of perfection. And he talks about how design in the natural order points to a designer. Russell Moore goes on to quote that Thomistic natural theology held certain truths about God, for example, his existence and attributes, could be known through reason alone. He's, I don't think he's saying there that they can't be known through Scripture, but hey, you can know those without Scripture, God's existence and attributes. And he says that Thomas was trying to build a bridge to the truths about that God that could only be known through Scripture or revealed theology, the gospel of Christ. Jesus' death in our place is not just written on the pages of the clouds. Pages of the clouds tell us a lot, but it does not tell us that Christ died in our place to redeem us from sin. He goes on to say that all of this was built on a view of epistemology, or that, which, how we know what we know, that believed even fallen humanity could still perceive and make use of the evidence for God built in the created order. And then others have come along and said, nope, sinfulness and the brokenness of society and depravity have made it where people can't understand that. And there's this dialogue. And if I wanted you, we could divide up into two different groups and we could go at each other. It'd be a great debate question. What can we know about God despite sin? Why can we not know about God because of sin? It'd be a great fun side-by-side argument, but we're not going to do that one. So, all right. We may or may not deal with this later. Um, So I'm going to give you, as we talk about natural theology, we talk often about creation. Um, Is there a Christian way to understand how God created? Historically, there has not been. If we want to argue that there was only one Christian way to understand how God created, we are ignorant of Christian history. Are there better ways? Yes. Are there bad ways? I would even say yes. Um, Are there ways that make most sense? I think so. But I think there's multiple ways, particularly throughout history, to understand how God created. Um, I'm going to refer you on to another book on this one. Um, And I'm going to first note, though, that there's at least three major options. There's a variety of other options and how you want to unpack some of these and the ways that you understand these. But I want to give you this note. It is absolutely possible to misinterpret the book of creation. Okay? It's absolutely possible to misinterpret the book of nature. We can read nature wrong. In fact, science has shown us a few things about reading nature wrong over time. Okay? For example, 
the earth revolves around the sun, not the other way around. It's possible to read creation wrong. It's also possible to read the Bible wrong. There's been times that Christians have read the Bible wrong. They read the Bible wrong, and it resulted in racism. Christians have read the Bible wrong, and it resulted in a variety of different things. It has resulted in all sorts of different problems. It's possible to read the Bible wrong in addition to reading creation wrong. So, do I suspect that I have read the Bible wrong in some way, shape, or form on a reg- right now? Do I think I read the Bible wrong? Yes, I just don't know where. But as I look through the pages of Christian theology and Christian history, I've got enough humility to recognize I probably don't have it all right. Is it possible to read creation wrong? Absolutely. Do we do that on a regular basis? Absolutely. Is it possible to read creation wrong on the timing and means by which God created the world wrongly? Absolutely. Okay. So hold it. Hold your view of how God created the world, having studied it. Hold it with humility. Hold it with grace. God, biblically, has to be creator. You cannot get away from the fact that God is creator in the pages of Scripture. How God created? Well, the Bible is not a science textbook. So it leaves us open to a variety of options. Some Christians would hold to a concept of God is the one behind theistic evolution or Christian views of evolution where God uses most of evolution. It is normally taught in the schools, but God is the one behind it all. God is actively governing it through the process of, the evolu- of evolution. Some subscribe to that. I think it is possible. I would disagree with some, uh, some people from the young earth position that would say it's not possible to hold that position to be a Christian because I don't see Jesus requiring that. Okay? Now, if God's not creator, I think you've gone away from the Christian view of God. How God creates and how God governs his creation, I think, is up in the air. That is not the position I subscribe to, but... I think it's a possible position. A young earth type of position that essentially suggests the world is somewhere between five and 10,000 years old. That God created, when you read Genesis 1 through all of chapter 1, it's seven literal consecutive days. Um, there is some good evidence for that. There are some good arguments for that. An old earth position where there's a variety of ways to understand how God created either through long periods of time on each day, between gaps between days, other types of ways to understand that that arrive at a much, a very similar in some cases timeline for how old the earth is versus theistic evolution, but actually look at God as a direct creator, not necessarily through evolutionary process. I think all three of those are legitimate positions. Um, I arrive at the simplest position for me, the simplest position that fits my little brain is a young earth position. It's where I arrive. I think it's the simplest position. I think it's the best reading of the Bible. But I understand how some other people read the Bible differently, particularly as they read the book of creation on that. So another discussion, another time if you want to have it. All right, there's also an argument for intelligent design. The argument from intelligent design often gets lumped in with how God created the world. And the intelligent design argument is close to Thomas's argument, uh, but it focuses on the complexity thing. Basically, Looking at the human eye and the number of things in it, it is way too complicated. Similar, it goes back to my whole, like, if I got four aces, 20 hands in a row when we're playing poker, you're going to have a problem with me. Um, The intelligent design community says the world is too complicated for there not to be a God who created it. Um, And they start from there. And they really are using natural theology as an in route or as an end on itself because that is not necessarily Christian. By the way, none of the natural theology stuff that we've hit at, for the most part, distinguishes Christianity from Judaism or from Islam. Natural theology looks pretty similar, so we got to get into the pages of Scripture. And I did allow us barely enough time. All right, pull out your Bibles. I'm going to let you talk to me for a minute because I've talked long enough. Let's see. Uh, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to assign you some texts. And then I'm going to ask you to identify what you see there that is a contribution towards natural theology or the ways in which that nature, that Scripture is saying nature teaches us about God. Okay? Uh, let's see. Tom and Leilani, Psalm 19. John and Jody, 
Psalm 8. Uh, let's see, Belinda and Chris. Romans 1, 18 and following through the end of the chapter. Jacob and Elizabeth step into Romans 2, 14 and 15. Lily, if you'll join Lonnie on Acts chapter 14. And ladies in the back, Acts chapter 17, that passage. All right, read the text. I want you to be thinking about what does this teach me about God from nature? How should I understand God on the basis of nature from this text? But what do you see from Scripture on the use of natural revelation or what nature reveals to us according to Scripture from Psalm 19? If you guys will give me a couple of observations. We see the glory of God and his creators and the works of his Okay. So the glory of God, the works of his hands. I already kind of started on that task, so I gave them another one to come back to at the end. All right, Psalm 8. God has given uh, us mankind uh, over the world. Okay. Man's dominion over the world is an act of God's revelation. Okay. Um, there's a comparison between... Uh, the works of creation, the moon and the stars with man, and it's like, what is man that, that you are mindful of him? Yep. The insignificance of our size, and yet the significance of us to God. Okay. Romans 1, 18 and following, what you find about that nature reveals and how people respond? I found invisible attributes, his invisible attributes, um, his eternal power, that's the forever part of him, and his divine nature, his excellence and delightfulness. Yep. And we can perceive all these things. In, and then in verse 25, it talks about the, the truth of him. Yep. God is truth. God is powerful. And yet, the response of mankind to that is universal. I, I also put like the worship of creation over the creator. Yeah. And then man turning away from what was natural. Right. Man turning away from natural in pursuit of sin as a corruptedness or an inward turn instead of an outward worship and rightful response to God in creation and natural revelation. Man is inwardly corrupted and reflects uh, on the wrong things, worships the wrong things, and works the wrong ways. Because though... The Bible leaves people, says people are without excuse for, not for what they can know about God and what God has made plain to them, not complicated, simple, clear. Humanity rejects universally the clear and plain knowledge of God that is available in creation. Okay. Jacob and Elizabeth. Uh, this passage... Uh, talks about those who do not have the law of God, um, who still do the law, um, prove that God has written the, his law on their hearts and consciences. So this talks about the moral argument um, that we automatically know what is right and wrong. Um, yep, this is the, the, one of the key texts for the moral argument from nature, where people know that it's generally wrong to eat your kids. Like, that should be known. Um, doesn't always work that way in creation, by the way, but it does work that way in humanity. Okay. Let's see, Acts chapter 14. Paul is speaking to a non-believing audience. This is beginning to be the mission use. It starts off with he's creator, and it shows that he gave good gifts to men, but men then made them idols. Okay. Argues about God as the one who is creator, and yet mankind turns it into idols. Talks about one of those evidences from creation is God giving you rain from heaven in fruitful seasons and satisfies your heart with food and gladness. And yet, despite Paul talking about that, the next word is actually that, uh, I don't think I actually, yeah, verse 18 does say, yet he like gives this example about, hey, don't worship me. God's the one that you should worship. He's the one that's given a witness of all these things. And like he barely restrains them from worshiping him. 
This is Romans 1 on display in Acts 14. Okay. Acts chapter 17. Paul has been captains. He's been noticing all over um, different idols and the idols. And he found one that said to unknown God. Mm -hmm. He took that, that experience, that opportunity to talk to them about real God and explain what God has given them. He's given them time and life and breath and everything they have. They were very boundaries and Jesus. Right. Yep. He proceeds from an open opportunity. It looks like he's discussing religion. And all of a sudden, he slips in and his argument starts from natural theology. God made the world. Let me tell you about the one God who made everything. He's the one that sustains it all. And by the way, he's the one that went to the cross for you. He starts from natural theology, bridges into special th revelation. Okay. Matthew chapter 6. This is the birds of the sky, lilies of the fields uh, passage to show God's provision for his creation, including he cares for that and he cares for us as well. Mm -hmm. So God takes care of the birds. God takes care of the flowers. God takes care of you. Jesus uses natural theology. God takes care of the birds. God takes care of the flowers. So God's going to take care of you. So, do I think it's appropriate to use natural theology? Well, I think I just showed my hands because I think I just said Jesus did. Uh, scripture at times gives us insights from natural revelation. Now, is it appropriate to do natural theology on its own? I don't think so because I think we need to be people of the book of God's word as we study God's world. But I think there's some things to be gleaned from that can inform our worship.